and welcome to episode 101 of Radio Raw Press. <laughs> we have the A hundred and a. A hundred and uno. One hundred and one. <laughs> because there you. are two ones in it. Um, We've done as many shows as there are Dalmatians. <laughs> we have. Um, yeah. How many Dalmatian puppies were there? Were there 99? I think so. 101. I don't know. Because there were two big, big boys. Pongo and Pelita. <laughs> that's the, the, them's the badgers. Dogs. Badger dogs. That's what Dalmatians are now, badger dogs. <laughs> I mean, they weren't two boys. What? <laughs> All dogs are boys. <laughs> they're, they're big boys. Big boys. Big boys. Big boys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so hi, welcome to episode 101. Uh, I am Rosie and I am dying. Um, We're all dying. <laughs> it's not very, to get morbid. I mean, but... I'm potentially dying a little bit faster than everyone else right now. Um, but I'm cock locked and ready to rock. <laughs> With me, as ever, is the ineffable Sarah. What does that mean? Is, is that Ill a bad thing? It means you can't be effed. Oh my god, you've just proven <laughs> that you're not ineffable by not knowing what ineffable means. I'm gonna With me lean Sarah. into it. I'm gonna <laughs> lean into it and pretend that I meant that. She's secretly <laughs> effable. <laughs> so effable with me is the effable Sarah and uh, Phil <laughs> how are you guys doing you alright yeah I'm not too bad I have a headache I didn't sleep well last night and I had a busy day and <laughs> wah 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 way to bring the tone down I know. Jesus <laughs> how, I'm having I a wonderful time further. over here and <laughs> what's wrong with you Sarah if you want. Um, I realised, I, well, you already know, I realised when I was sat at work today that in a year I've had 10 days off work. I mean, that's just, is that, that's Which, not including weekends, is it? It's not including weekends, but if I worked for somebody else, it would be illegal. Mm. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, you'd probably get like paid more if you worked for someone else as well. Oh, almost certainly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now that we've, um, really, you know... <laughs> brought the level of conversation down to a grinding halt um we watch mandy i feel like i don't know maybe we'd be in a better mood if we hadn't watched mandy <laughs> oh i mean <laughs> At the beginning, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll get into the, the transition <laughs> throughout the film, um, but I'm gonna say it it was an experience. It oh, was yeah. definitely an experience. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I feel I, like we've had a bit of a rocky start. <laughs> We're all none of us are at our best, but I think like things will pick up from here on in because I've been very keen to hear what you particularly have to say i feel like have you and i talked about this film we haven't because i haven't seen it and i know absolutely i knew nothing about it this is uh, the first time watched from, for both of you yep. aside right. from at some point there would be a drug-fueled rampage <laughs> right and, and oh what a rampage <laughs> it turned out to be i'm just i'm just gonna say that but like i i stayed away from the trailers um okay. the only thing i'd seen is like that face um and yeah, I knew next to nothing about it. Um, so it was going in pretty blind, which I think was the best way to do it, definitely. Mm. I think that's the best way to consume any film, really. Yeah, I stand by that. Like, if I yeah. can, if it's a film that I'm really looking forward to, I'll actually try not to watch the trailer. For sure. Yeah, which, funnily enough, um, you weren't there for the last minisode and I was kind of gutted, Rosie, because I finally got around to watching Possessor and I wanted to talk to you about it. <laughs> and I'm only bringing it up now because I think I feel like the films are somewhat, somewhat similar in tone and both star Andrea Riseborough. And so Andrea there is Riseborough, a connection. Who, who um, I have feelings about. Okay. Um. <laughs> Interesting. That's vague. <laughs> it, is, it is vague, and I think it's vague um, for a reason because her character was really vague 
and maybe a little bit disappointing apart from certain parts in the film okay um, when you say disappointing do you mean you expected more because she's the eponymous character the film is literally named after her um i guess like it was really obvious from the beginning that like she was mandy obviously yeah. even though they don't actually say her name to her at any point during the film um jeremiah does jeremiah calls her mandy and i was like why do you know that her name's mandy when it hasn't been mentioned at all um, did we miss the introduction is, scene? <laughs> is is this is this god speaking to you um so yeah she's like she's basically unnamed up until right before she's r- removed from the film spoilers um, yep uh, spoiler, I mean, spoiler alert is kind of I, I redundant think it's, at this I think point. I think it's very difficult to say anything about this film without spoiling it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, you, just, you should just assume that if you haven't watched this film yet, then go away and watch it and then listen to the episode because it's not going to make a lick of sense. Oh, it might not even if you do. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's very, very true. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I kind of felt like there was a... <laughs> There was more that she could have done with the character of Mandy. Like, Mandy's clearly a very anxious, very introverted, like, very um, nervous person. And I just didn't yeah. feel like they lent into that at Visible all. Like, flower. it wasn't enough for me. Mm. She was just, like, she was very nothingy. Mm. Okay. Um, up until certain points which we'll talk about later but i've got ahead of myself what we should do first um is read the synopsis on the back of the dvd which is what we do every single time and i'm a fucking idiot so uh who's got a dvd copy in front of them i can read it i mean it's a very bare binds plot but i'll read you 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 (laughs) i've got i have got my torch on it's very dark (laughs) in my house stop mocking me My eyesight is terrible. It's all that ambient lighting you keep insisting on. (laughs) So, Pacific Northwest, 1983 AD. Outsiders Red Miller and Mandy Bloom lead a loving and peaceful existence when their pine-scented haven is savagely destroyed by a cult led by the sadistic Jeremiah Sand. Red is catapulted into a phantasmagoric journey filled with bloody vengeance and laced with fire. I love the word phantasmagoric. And Mm. drugs. I mean, maybe that was implied with phantasmagoric. I don't know. Hallucinogenic. <laughs> Psychotropic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If, if you are anti-drugs, then I would say <laughs> probably don't watch this film. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there because um, there's a lot of drugs in this film. <laughs> This is like an it's, it's like an inverse drugs. dare infomercial. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> basically like if you take enough drugs, you will become a fucking badass. <laughs> yeah, like imagine if the Grange Hill cast were actually singing "Just Say Yes." <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. That'll, I love that. That will only make sense to the English listeners, <laughs> and probably not if you were born too far after we were oh god (laughs) you've managed to make me feel isolated and old in one sentence um i want to talk for a second about the soundtrack for a start because that's the first thing that you hear Mm. and see and it's just like johan johansson r.i.p is just phenomenal all the way through why do i remember or what have i misremembered that the band son were involved at some point in the soundtrack that would not surprise me but i hadn't read anything about it um i I know that the first track was by king crimson yes because that's Um, sort of referenced later on isn't it yeah yeah um it really wouldn't surprise me there's a lot of sort of like quite sludgy doom Uh, yeah yeah, like that kind of doom metal going on which uh, i for one i'm a massive fan of like the soundtrack for me was so far up my alley it was amazing Um, you need to watch the devil's candy because they did the original music for that as well the devil's no i watched a different film with candy in the title yes (laughs) i watched hard candy which i think is a very very different different. film Uh, (laughs) but um yeah johansson i mean he 
him and Dennis Villeneuve were like eh, in love because yeah. um, he worked on Arrival, Sicario. Mm. Um, he did work on Blade Runner twenty forty nine, but he basically got fired. Oh, um, well, Villeneuve said that he wanted to go back to a more Vangelis sound and take the film in a different direction, which is like code speak for you're doing too much cocaine. Please don't do my music <laughs> on the film anymore. <laughs> um, so he basically, yeah, said, we're just taking the film in a different direction, Johan. Why don't you go oh. to rehab for a while? Um, and then, um, yeah, very, very, very sadly, a couple of years ago, he he overdosed on cocaine and flu meds. And yeah, it was the was same what, year that Mandy was released. Yeah, he was 48. He was 48. <sighs> it, was, it was released posthumously mm. um, after he died. So, yeah, really, really sad. And he was, like, at the peak of his career, Um an absolutely fucking phenomenal musician mm-hmm. as well. Mm. Totally could have been like the next Hans Zimmer. Yeah. I, I would um, say the soundtrack to this movie in particular is one of my favourite things about it. Mm. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, th- this, for me, is what like Goblin should be on other horror films. <laughs> Do you know goblins. what I mean? <laughs> Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to fucking Cheddar Goblins. Oh my god. Um, so, so Nick, did you say his name is Red? Because it's not actually mentioned in the film at all. Um, Do you, they not say his no, name? They never say so his no. name in the film. The huh. only, in fact, um, I made a note. The only names that they say are the brothers and sisters, Jeremiah uh-huh. and Mandy. Yeah, they never say anyone else's name. I mean, is that because we're supposed to sort of see things through his eyes? So he's kind of an everyman conduit for the audience, maybe? I think potentially, but I also think there's a lot to be said for the religious iconography throughout the film and the um, names hold power. Okay. Um, so, like... Uh, you know, like God actually has two other names, but you can't use them because mm. um, they're too holy. So maybe like only the holiest actually have names, that kind of thing. That was the impression the two I names? got. Derek, uh, <laughs> Derek and, and <Rodney>. Martin. <laughs> I feel like they would be proper nerdy names. I got they're, no, they're too um. It's like it's a legit <laughs> thing that they're too um like Aramaic names that I can't remember at the moment but basically um, uh, it's only a Jewish Passover like the head of the synagogue is allowed to say them once or something and like those oh, names man. are so holy but everybody refers to him as their god because that's like the given name that they've given him in order to refer to him as which is which isn't this so is, holy this is why I hate religion guys there's too many fucking yeah. rules I'm, if you hate religion then getting into this film is going to be a fucking blast because holy shit <laughs> holy shit <laughs> holy fucking shit um, Nick Cage Red uh-huh. whatever his name is is yes. a furious man he- from the very <laughs> beginning do you, do you get that vibe from Cut. minute one Cutting down trees without any protective gear and just looking <laughs> utterly furious. See, I like, didn't get that vibe. He hates being outside. He hates <laughs> being at work. I mean, fair. Same. He hates <laughs> yeah. driving. Fair. He so gets you- home and sees his girlfriend and suddenly he like melts into this soft, caring character. Yeah. So your takeaway from that opening was just fuck you, nature. <laughs> yeah. Maybe <laughs> <Okay>. he's vegan. <laughs> That's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> fuck these <Call> trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like he's just a very, very angry man. Um, and then yeah, he gets home to Mandy, and he becomes this like soft caring like he's so interested in what she's doing like the, I think, the sweetest I think that's a sort really of boyfriend good, um indicator of how much power she has though yeah like how serene um and almost like ethereal she is yeah it, it's kind of really evident in the effect she has on those around her she kind of floats around everywhere um, yeah i mean apart from the point where nick cage comes in and goes no Knock! <laughs> like, what the fuck are you doing? Lil was watching it and he said that and I was like, what the fuck? 
This better she's, end than a good joke. <laughs> she's drawing. <laughs> I've got a knock knock joke that you have to start, Sarah. Oh no. Go on. Knock knock. Who's there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> A hundred and one Dalmatians. <laughs> that, that was... <laughs> I don't want any day. fuck off. At this time of hour. <laughs> at this entirely time of my, hour. Entirely outside my front door. Can I see it? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're a strange man, Seymour, but you do steam a good ham. I don't get it. What's the joke? <laughs> <sighs> it's a Simpsons reference to Aurora Borealis. Aurora Borealis. <laughs> Which Except is sort Phil of got the quote wrong. Oh, I don't care. You Phil. know what I was talking about. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have even if I'd got the quote right. <laughs> because I am effable. <laughs> I don't believe. <laughs> so effable. <laughs> Wait, no, effable is that sounds wrong. <laughs> you are you're effable, baby. No, I don't like that. <laughs> sound weird (laughs) (laughs) I'm just gonna like crowbar this in here did Mm -hmm. Elijah Wood produce Mm -hmm. this yes Spectre Vision Spectre Vision right I I cannot in my head there's there's like a missing neuron between (laughs) Spectre Vision and Elijah Wood (laughs) see I I only know about it because of him like um because of Hitler because of (laughs) yes Yes, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Let me finish. You mean one Dolph Hitler. <laughs> How fucking dare you. <laughs> you were saying. Uh, was I? Right. Thanks, apparently. <laughs> it's, um, it's Elijah Wood and his uh, business partner, whose name I always forget and I feel really bad about it. Um, but he's not Elijah Wood, so I don't get that much. <laughs> Elijah Wood and not Elijah Wood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Elijah um, Wood and that other one. Well, um, Spectre Vision have worked on loads of stuff recently, haven't they? They're well, like... they did Colour Out of Space mm. as well. Oh, which, that makes a whole fucking load of sense. <laughs> which I'm guessing is where the sort of working relationship with Nick Cage emerged from. Like, Can you imagine being mates with Nick Cage? I would love nothing more. Right? <laughs> Like what a guy! I'm. Uh, he looks absolutely fucking massive in this film as well. Oh, he's very imposing, yeah. But he's he's like six foot. He's okay. not. That, he's not massively tall. Six feet is quite tall. Yeah, I mean, but bear in mind, like a lot of the men we know are like <laughs> six three, six four. I have no like. Maybe I have height blindness. <laughs> Like, I don't it, really register it. it. I would, I'm, I'm going to offend a lot of people here, but I would say like <laughs> six three and above, I would consider tall. I would consider six foot and above to be tall. But he's like right at the bottom end of that spectrum. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like he's he's an average sized ma- m- man. <laughs> he's sure, just, but because Andrea Riseborough is like. Oh, she's five little. four or something. Yeah. He just looks fucking huge in comparison well, think, to her. I do think an element of that is his performance, though. Mm. He he holds a very domineering like performance for sure. Yeah, and I, one thing that really surprised me actually is when I was doing some research for this show, um, I read a few articles, and in a couple of places, people sort of referred to this as like a breakout performance. Uh, it's just like, are you aware of how long he's been working in this profession? <laughs> Have you not seen Face Off? Have you not seen Raising Arizona? Have you not seen Con Air? <laughs> Have you not seen The Wicker Man? <laughs> how dare <laughs> you? <laughs> Phil, get out, leave. <laughs> and take the bees with you. For fuck's sake. Not the bees. Covered in the bees. <laughs> oh, God. He chose the bees. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, he just, he's, you're right, he's very imposing. He's very, mm. um, large character. And he only gets sort of larger than mm. life all the way through the film as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think 
Can, I just want to touch on the structure of the film very quickly. Um, yeah. No, I'd love to. So, <laughs> obviously, climax. We got that out of our systems. But as we were watching this, I was just like, there were a couple of points where I was just like, what is it with films where people do drugs through their eyes and the credits are halfway through the film? exactly <laughs> this as I was watching it. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's like Climax. <laughs> yeah. And like the, the title for the film shows up in the middle at the beginning of an entirely new film. It, it's it's about an hour and 15 minutes mm. in that we get the title card, yeah. which is and it's, insane. it's a two hour long film. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty much like smack bang in the middle. They go, yeah, fuck it. Here's what the film's called. And now here's a brand new film yeah. where shit gets really fucking weird. <laughs> See, I, I almost took that to be the name of the third chapter rather than the title card. Well, there had been others, weren't there? There, there was like Children yeah. of a New there Dawn, was, yeah. a There was Shadow Mountains and Children that of a New yeah, Dawn. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, I kind of interpreted that as, as the third act, as it were. Yeah. Rather and than actually, the title card of the film. The fonts were all quite interesting choices because they... Um, they, they made me think of like... representative. Well, yeah, but they also really kind of made me recall um like vintage horror paperbacks from like the 70s and the 80s yeah for sure um a lot of the stuff that's kind of covered in paperbacks from hell the font choices had to be to do with that especially since like she was reading um a book that looked a lot like that which she was made a- up for the mm. film it wasn't a real book yeah it's not a real book it is called i wrote it down it's called seeker of the serpent's eye which is fucking mm. metal it's all shit the whole film is well, just I think so that's metal. the same i think that's the oh, same name as one cult. of the songs in the film yeah Oh, okay. one of the songs that was um, by somebody who by worked on it and it's it's by okay. somebody called lenore tall um the book and um, okay. i do you know that doesn't something something Lenore, the name Lenore, mm-hmm. like fabric softener, shouts out to me as <laughs> something. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe. There are so many references to horror and mm-hmm. the macabre throughout this film. Like they live down by Crystal Lake. Mm-hmm. Um, there's references to um, like Hellraiser, the deer that she finds oh, in the yeah, woods the, um... is like the baby in a razor head. Yeah, the the biker gang were very sort of. They were very Hellraiser, like Cenobites. They were a little bit, yeah, verging on that, definitely. Yeah, um, I a lot more sort of rusty, if you like. Yeah. But... <laughs> rusty Cenobites. <laughs> rusty Cenobites, <laughs> but they had like um, the one who was wearing a mask looks a lot like oh, what's his chatter butterball? Is it? I got I the got chatter chatter as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, and then you've got like it was a spiky one, head. obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was a spiky one, um, but but yeah, like there there are so many little references to mm. modern horror. Obviously, um, I know I'm skipping forward a bit, but the church, like how reminiscent of the uh, chapel in Midsummer was that. I literally wrote that in my notes. Like, um, why do so many of my favorite modern horrors feature triangular buildings on fire? <laughs> Just like, oh, I wonder if there's a man in a bear suit in there. <laughs> well, you um, can only hope. Nick Cage. <laughs> I, I want to, uh, I need to do a little bit more research. I probably should have done it before the show, to be honest. But, um, <laughs> oh, the, you would The weapons that they have, um, mm-hmm. that the children of the New Dawn have, the Horn of Abraxas and the yeah. Sword of the Pale Knight. Um, the tainted blade of the pale knight there you go when they're um, passing them to one another Uh they've got this like strobing green Mm. light behind them yeah and that cannot have been just a thing they thought would look cool oh no I feel like everything in this film is very purposeful like the colour work especially yeah definitely Um, I, I try. I did try to do a little bit of research on this actually, because um, the Horn of Abraxas, particularly, I didn't find very much. If I'm well, honest, I, but did, obviously I didn't Abraxas, know if it was made up or if it was like well, an actual thing. Um, the Horn of Abraxas is. I don't think it's an actual thing, but Abraxas was um, a, like a trickster demon who tried to fool people into believing he was God. 
Oh, so if that okay, doesn't represent Jeremiah Sand, then I don't know yeah, what does. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a theory that um, abracadabra comes from the word abraxas. Really? Yeah. Oh, that would make sense, yeah. Abraxas cadabra. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then there's the, yeah, the Tainted Blade of the Pale Knight. Mm-hmm. Um, the dude, Pinhead, Rusty yes. Pinhead, <laughs> which is a terrible porn name. Um, <laughs> Rusty Pinhead. <Yeah. laughs> um, if he was, he, his, uh, what's it called? Helmet. No, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. This helmet is like a knight's helmet, and I was like, yeah. "Oh, so, and like, oh, is that? Uh, is this? Uh, is that his? Is it his sword? Did you borrow his sword?" Because <laughs> um, they only turn up with it after they've blown the horn of Abracadabra. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really like. I want to know what the thought process was behind this, like flashing green light behind them. Mm. Mm. Like, if it clearly, it's some sort of show of magical power that has been bestowed upon these objects but is it like cursed is it it's interesting isn't it because you can kind of look at the coding behind certain colors i mean green in theater especially is seen as being evil yeah but it also represents nature and Mm. arguably they represent the most unnatural things in the film so is it supposed to be subversive I don't know. Ultimately, I don't have any answers, but I think oh, it's very I, interesting. I don't have any answers for this entire film, to be honest. Like, I mean, the, Nick, Nick Cage's character is literally named after the most aggressive colour. And um, in the second half of the film, throughout, he is literally bathed in red. Mm. Yes. Uh, literally, um, like, in blood and also very red lighting. Yeah, no, the concept <laughs> of red lighting throughout the film was such an important one because it, it pretty mm. much starts off um, with red lighting on Jeremiah. Yeah. Um, Jeremiah is God, he holds all the power. So it was really interesting um, that uh, we were talking about what the red light represented and... The first thought was that, oh, you know, like satanic, Satanism, red light, demons, Mm -hmm. you know, all that sort of stuff. And I was like, I don't I don't think so. I think that the red light is more representative of like the blood of the covenant. Yeah. I mean, to be um, honest, on a on a really base level, when I think of the color red in terms of coding in films, I just think danger. mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I admittedly I looked like potentially too far into it, but because this film has so many deep seated like religious connotations mm-hmm. um between the intermixing of um christianity and satanism but yeah or, or satanic cults yes um, yeah rather than actual what satanism Christians think because satanism hell yourself is. motherfuckers but yeah um <laughs> but the the color red is so representative of so many things and it it just instantly made me think of as well as the like opposmatism of it it made me think of like yeah the the blood of the covenant and like jesus giving his blood to his disciples and like jeremiah is literally exuding this color all the mm-hmm. way through the film right up until the point um that it's taken away from him yeah, that, that power's removed from him. I really want to talk about that scene. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. <laughs> um, there is a beautiful scene again, uh, which is completely covered in red, which is just Jeremiah's face mm-hmm. staring <sighs> at Mandy after they've oh. like taken her after they've removed her. Um, I hated that when they like and the her bit face where they is kind of like, the face they're like morphing yeah. into it. It's like it. Um, it reminded me of you know that film Phil where there's a guy <laughs> sitting in a chair and he turns into someone else and then he turns back again and he's in the uh, background. The Conjuring Two. Yeah. Uh, the Enfield Haunting. Uh, po- uh, yeah, the Enfield Poltergeist. Yeah, um, where like that slowly yeah. pans into something else and then pans back again. I don't um, like it. 
I don't care for it. <laughs> it's it's re- it's really effective. It's really kind of creepy, um, mm. and it works so well because their faces are actually very similar. Mm. Like geometrically, it was yeah. it worked a bit too well. Yeah, and, and I think that's what freaked me out. And her like, and it was an interesting bit where they were transposing her face onto his, but he was still saying the words about how he was the new god because. Mm-hmm well actually is she the new god in that case and then the fact that she laughs at him like that genuinely the funniest thing I've ever seen is a man furiously (laughs) wanking saying shut up shut up don't look at me (laughs) I I think that scene is so well done and I I wonder it's so chaotic it is Um, in terms of like Linus Roach and his performance Mm. as the cult leader I mean, obviously there are very heavy shades of Charles Manson, especially with like the failed music career and the insane narcissism. Referring to Uh, his victims as pigs. Oh yeah, um, I didn't catch that. There's a face that he pulls, um, Mm -hmm. which Charlie Manson did. Charlie Mark, mate. Um, (laughs) Me old mucker. Me old mucker. Chuck Manson. (laughs) Chucky M. Um... (laughs) So, <laughs> me old boy Chucky M. So there is a face that he pulls. Um, there's. Have you heard of San Puku? That sounds made up. <laughs> it's Japanese. Um, it's how somebody's eyes look, and okay. it's basically the theory that um, if somebody looks straight at a camera and you can see the whites either above their eyes or below their eyes, Mm -hmm. then they're said to have Sam Puku eyes. And it's kind of a curse. Oh, God. Like, they are more likely to die earlier for having these eyes. So, like, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Audrey Hepburn um, had them. um, Charles Manson in his photos, he looks that psychotic that you can see the whites above his eyes. That's really um, that's interesting you say that because the one thing that I noticed about the character Mandy, yeah, more than anything else, is how wide-eyed she seemed throughout yeah. the whole thing, and how um, I mean, obviously, it was a choice to have her completely bare-faced, no makeup at any point, the um, scar that doesn't get talked about. No, never mentioned. Um, but yeah, there, there were certain scenes where it kind of focused on her face really intently. And I found my, found myself wondering if they'd digitally altered her to make her eyes look larger. I think she was wearing scleral lenses. Do you? Um, yeah. And actually, uh, you know, the scene where she's walking out of the river and she's standing behind the fire. Yeah. Um, which is a sort of foreboding. It's like very prophetic yeah um, one of her eyes gets bigger than the other and starts to move downwards I, that's what i thought yeah I, what, what, and it's so undiscernible yeah <laughs> one of my notes i want wonder- sorry keep interrupting no carry on i just i wondered if i had actually seen it or if i was just going a bit do lally do you know what i mean mm. one of my notes reads heterochromia question mark question mark question mark because okay. i was convinced that she had different colored eyes Really? Yeah, just, or do you think it was just maybe but, they were different sort of size and like, it gave the there illusion? There was something that made one seem darker than the other. Yeah, well, that's and the, the so, one that melts down that would make sense. Although I think I, I think it's all quite a lot of foreshadowing because her eyes get yeah. really big, her pupils get massive, which obviously oh, happens yeah. like when Post you are drugs. under the influence of drugs. Yeah. Um, but that like eye slowly melting down was the very beginning of like the breakdown of reality where mm. she's standing in front of the fire. And I so, felt like that in itself was very prophetic of her being burned and then yeah. reality cracking at the seams. So interestingly, um, a lot of people refer to David Bowie as having had heterochromia. Um, but he didn't. No. One of his no. pupils was just far larger than the other, giving the illusion of different colour eyes. Well, so he got bonked on the me, head, didn't he? Yeah, but it makes me wonder if they could sort of utilised something to to mimic Potentially. that. I, I'm pretty sure she had scleral lenses in because mm-hmm. her eyes anyway just looked a lot bigger mm-hmm. than anyone else's. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I almost to the point where I didn't recognise it was Andrea Riseborough. Okay. Um, because I wasn't used to. She looks 
uh, cartoonish. She in looks places, like she was yeah. in a, an, an, like an anime, which is really interesting when you think that all of Red's dreams are in cartoon mm-hmm. and they all feature her. Um, well, I mean, there's, there are theories as to whether or not the whole thing was cooked up in his imagination or in a dream. fucked up, cocaine-fueled yeah. mind. <laughs> I don't know how much stock I put in that theory. I, I prefer to read it in a more literal way. I mean... I would find it difficult to believe that somebody wouldn't actually drink a jar of weird grey spunk. <laughs> Did that not really creep you out? Like, the fact... Okay, so... <laughs> Red finds this jar of, like, odd stuff, like grey stuff. Try the grey stuff, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe me, ask these bitches. Um... <laughs> And he tastes like a... For a start, he looks at it and goes, wonder what that tastes like. Mm -hmm. Terrible idea. (laughs) And then he tastes it... Tell me that's not a thought you've had. (laughs) What, when I pick up a a jar of, like, grey goop? I know. Would put money on you. (laughs) Getting curious. (laughs) I'm gonna lick it. (laughs) I mean, you'd probably ask if it was vegan first. (laughs) I'd ask if it was vegan, and then I'd try and get someone else to taste it. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I am being poisoned. You would find your drunkest friend. <laughs> yeah, hit, lick this. <laughs> oh, that's usually I just, me. I just oh, no. put it on my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he like he tastes it and he sees forever and hell. He sees mm-hmm. hell. Yeah, basically. And he sees himself like melting and reforming as like this hell hellish creature. Mm-hmm. And those guys on quad bikes they're drinking jars of this stuff Mm -hmm. what the fuck (laughs) like is this a tolerance issue i don't so the guys on the quad bikes uh the black skulls the rust the rusty cenobites yeah the black skulls i think they're (laughs) called um they are they are so obviously we get a little bit of backstory on those guys and that they were sort of uh, former drug couriers who took some tainted LSD and were never the same after that. But they seem to have like a supernatural edge to them as well. And as far yeah. as I know, LSD can't do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, they've clearly taken DMT, haven't they? So I, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. They do have this supernatural element in the sense that somebody blows a stone ocarina and then they just turn up yeah that was and they pretty know weird. exactly where they are <laughs> like i think everything within this film has got some kind of like metaphysical power behind it i don't think there's okay. a person in this film who doesn't have some sort of power what about the cheddar goblin <laughs> I, I mean, mean it's, he vomits it's power kids, is to yeah so. it, it, it's power is to produce mac and cheese at will <laughs> I would 100% if it was vegan I'd have a cheddar goblin yopping up mac and cheese for me would every you? day and I, I really um... like the term yopping up as well <laughs> we've never heard that before yop 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 so you know how in every episode I say something that you guys hate me for too yes. many cooks too yep. many cooks <laughs> the cheddar one goblin, step ahead. cheddar goblin segment was directed by Casper Kelly who also directed too many cooks. <laughs> you are a complete bastard. Sarah I did know first. that, though. Sarah got I did first. know that. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I was just I'm used to her being a pest. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the, the Cheddar Goblin itself, the, the sweaty puppet... It's a gremlin, um, right? It, it was based on the ghoulies. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, that, that was makes hella sense. Also built by at least one of the people who created Smarf from Too Many Cooks, so it was it was definitely a bit of an Adult Swim mm-hmm. collaboration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Elijah Wood and Adult Swim, like they've got links, haven't they? Um, I don't know if they do. They should. They uh, they absolutely should. I know that, that seems got... like a match made in heaven. I feel like Elijah Wood has his little Elijah Wood fingers in many many pies. <laughs> 
Like he's been on Yo Gabba Gabba. Come you on. just made that sound so weird. <laughs> His little creepy Elijah Wood fingers. Oh, he's not creepy. Sticking into little pies. He's lovely and we should protect him at all costs. Well, we're going to have to protect him because his fingers are covered in pies. <laughs> <laughs> he can't use his hands. <laughs> and that immediately makes him a liability. <laughs> yeah. Elijability would. No! <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm really proud of that. You should be. <laughs> Hard disagree. No. I hate you. I'm with that one. <laughs> Eligibility fingers in pies wood. That's too long. <laughs> um, do you have? Do you, I actually, I was going to say, do you have a favourite line from this film? And I think you do. And I think I know what it is, but it's not mine. Um, okay, mine is the cleansing power of fire cannot be reasoned with. Oh, I like that. That's very metal. Just, this oh, whole film is like the most so, metal right. so film like, ever. The, so the, 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 the imagery, like the, the t- there's a fa- there's a tiger in there for like no reason. Like Red forges well, his own axe to. That's a great. Ti- there is a tiger in there for a reason. That's yeah. what he tests all his LSD on. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. Fine. Duh. But it wasn't necessary. What else what I'm are saying. you going to test all your acid on? <laughs> apart from a tiger. <laughs> it's the natural choice. Actually, that was an incredible scene. The fact that, like, he'd. It, it, so it gives the impression that actually LSD, again, with the black skulls, they're taking mm-hmm. some tainted LSD and they'd, like, become something otherworldly and, like, more than human. Um, this guy who makes the LSD. Mm-hmm. Um, is kind of more than human himself. Like he can hear what Red is saying without him talking. He's. I like the actor. He, he's. Um, I've seen him in a few things at this point, Richard Brake, and I kind of associate him with um, Rob Zombie's worst films. <laughs> so this oh, kind no. of redeemed him a little bit in my eyes um, because I think he's he's an actor who's really good at like delivering monologues and this he's quite wiry and there's nothing to him but he's got a lot of gravitas do you know who i think would have been really good in that role and i hate myself for saying it oh no jared leto no no (laughs) no yeah why he would have been great (laughs) because of um his uh, character in Blade Runner 2049. No, I don't like, like Jared Leto. He really Leto. redeemed He's himself not. with that. Well, yeah, so's this guy. He just had to be himself. But Jared Leto tried to start an actual cult in real life. I know. He's off his nuts. <laughs> That's why he'd be really good at it. <laughs> well, you'd have um, to tell him it was a documentary. <laughs> there was a re- yeah, fair. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely fair. Um, but I can't I, I, I can't get over the fact that I think that every time I think of somebody who can like hear somebody else's thoughts and is like a main line to God or whatever, I just think Jared Leto. Which is, I think I might become <laughs> I think that's part what of his he cult. Thinks as well. <laughs> I think I might become part of his cult. Okay. Against my will. <laughs> because <laughs> apparently I think he can talk to God. Um so yeah can we spend a second talking about mandy's death i feel Uh, like we would be remiss to not mention it um i'd like to talk about the scene that precedes it more the shut up scene yeah um the the wanking scene not for the, the not for that reason yeah not for the it's not for the wanking but that's my favorite moment in the film and it's just because like um the director panos cosmatos was kind of quoted in an interview was saying like he saw that as well he saw jeremiah san as like the ultimate expression of um toxic masculinity and fragile yeah. male ego yeah and for sure. just intense narcissism um, but actually he's quite a boring ordinary man who just thinks he's special yeah like there's well, nothing all? well yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so in that in that respect he's kind of like a walking men's rights activism diatribe 
When's International Men's Day? <laughs> it's the 21st of November. Go <laughs> <Get over> yourselves. <laughs> Not all men. Um, but definitely that one. Same goes yeah. at the end, though. When um, Just to skip ahead, when Red actually confronts so, him properly, it, mm, he breaks down oh, we'll, quickly. We'll, uh, we'll get to that, too. We'll get I know, to I'm that. Just, I'm just saying it's the same like principle, right? But yeah, the, so the director's kind of been quoted as saying there's nothing funnier than a man who thinks he's the centre of the universe. Um, being which, shown that he's not. We, yeah, and basically she, in a very simple way, completely emotionally eviscerates mm. and emasculates him. Yeah, she just utterly dismantles his th- thoughts and beliefs. Yeah, his sense of self. Yeah. Or a overinflated sense of self, should I say? By, by laughing, yeah, without by, even she saying doesn't a have word, to say anything. She doesn't have to call him by his name. Mm-hmm. She doesn't have to, and and she she doesn't talk throughout that whole thing. Basically, she yeah. just she holds her power with her reactions and how again quite commanding she is in her role. Yeah with her silence like her silence is very much a plus point for her it's very much a like act of power for her Mm -hmm. her silence yeah and i think it the the moments after that sort of highlight how much of a fucking coward he really is because not only does he not do any of the dirty work himself yeah he gets other people to do it for him um but i mean that that sort of violence is in real world terms, often brought about by things like humiliation. Yeah. Um, he lashes out like a child mm. in a really devastating way, but it's born of nothing more than a man's ego being crushed. He's embarrassed. Yeah. And that's the yeah, saddest absolutely. thing. And you've got you've got Nicolas Cage, he's tied up um in, in very much a kind of cruciform position yeah um wearing a literal crown of thorns with like barbed wire wrapped around his wrists and mouth Mm -hmm. um watching the only person that he knows or cares about in the world die and the i think the thing that shocked me most about that scene was that she's brought out and she's wrapped in a cloth Mm -hmm. like a sort of duvet sleeping bag whatever Mm -hmm. And she is thrown about like she's a dead body. Yeah. And you assume that she's already dead. And they're just burning the corpse to make a stand, to make mm-hmm. a point. Um, and then when it's set on fire, you see this burning bag like writhing mm-hmm. about. And it's that affected me more than anything else in the film. And mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty sure. It was the moments after that. It was. It... <sighs> It was Nicholas Cage's reaction. Scenes of him literally sort of staring at her ashes. Oh, the whole like, ashes, me. ashes, dust to dust. Like it literally just disappears. She just disappears. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it's a really interesting question about like the power that people have, how quickly that can be taken away from them. Mm-hmm. Um, Not just power, happiness, anything. Yeah, well, well, I I use power as a very loose term in terms yeah. of like you know happiness and security and love and all of that kind of thing. That's that you know that's all a sense of power to me and like mm-hmm. the the ability to affect other people is a power. But just like how quickly that can be snuffed out. Yeah, it's all very fragile. Mm-hmm. And it, do any of us in any walk of life really have any power? Mm. Because it's so easily removed. You can build up as many like walls as you like with people protecting you, but at the end of the day, somebody just needs to get to you and that's it. Yeah, I think... Uh, obviously, Phil already touched on that ending. Um, mm. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I, I quite like how Mandy's death and Jeremiah Sand's death were kind of juxtaposed in that she retained her power when she laughed at him and yes it led to her death but her death had some dignity and his was completely gone by that point yeah yeah absolutely he died a coward mm. and she didn't he he died a coward offering to 
suck Red's cock. Yeah. yeah. Like, which for a man who is stated like, you know, red-blooded heterosexual man, mm-hmm. like a cis white guy, like that's for them. Not for just, him, yeah, not just that, like but one with, a, one with a harem of women mm. at his command as well, yeah, supposedly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, I mean, it's it's at that point. So the point at which Mandy dies, um, there follows like an entire scene of Nick Cage basically, um, again, losing his mind, dismantling his own reality and then kind of building it back up again. Um, a lot's been said about that scene. Um, and I don't want to labour like, on it too why much. Why is there vodka in the bathroom? Well, but because he's a recovering alcoholic. Because so. he's a recovering yeah. alcoholic and it's a hidden stash, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to labour too much on that scene because a lot of people have talked about it. It's, it's the scene that gets talked about the most when people talk about this film. But I think it's really inter- interesting that um, Mandy dies at almost exactly the halfway point yeah. in the running time. Yeah. And everything up to that point is filmed in a really dreamlike, trippy, psychedelic way. And actually that scene is in stark contrast because it's actually quite brightly lit. Mm. Um, yeah. It's, there are no filters. It's very, like, There are no close-ups. We just see him losing his shit. Yeah. There's and, a, there's a know, really interesting um, shot just before he goes into the bathroom, like just as he's falling asleep, where there's an emergency broadcast test mm-hmm. um, and his oh, eyes yeah. close to the sound of a single tone. Yeah. Like he's just lost a heartbeat, um, which I thought was really interesting because it's mm-hmm. like he's dying and then he's been reborn kind of thing. So, okay, there's a, there's an interesting analogy here with basically Nick Cage being Jesus. Okay. I mean, it's it's shown uh, at the point where he's like, yeah, in this cruciform position with mm-hmm. a crown of thorns and then he effectively dies. Well, he's even stabbed um, in his side, which is the same place that Jesus yeah, was stabbed. Yeah, he's stabbed in his ribs. Yeah. Um, he, he effectively dies, like his eyes closed. There is a single tone. Mm-hmm. He wakes up... Um, is not the same person that he was before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next scene that you have is him forging a weapon in a cave. <laughs> Which apparently was um, a tribute to a metal band, and I didn't write it down. Celtic Frost. Oh, Celtic Frost. Right, okay. Nice. Yeah, the, the accent <laughs> is meant to echo their logo. But I just want, before we carry on, I just want to add to that, it might not mm-hmm. actually... Because it's a different scene, it might not add as much to think it does. But not only do we get stabbed from the side, crown of thorns, his hands also nailed to the floor later on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I was just about to get to yeah. that. Yeah. Like literally his hand is nailed mm. and he has stigmata. Um but yeah, he's he's in a cave forging a weapon. Yeah. God knows how long he spends there. Maybe three days. <laughs> um and then he emerges. Where's my Easter egg? <laughs> but, like, and then he like emerges from this cave and he's a reborn he is a different person and he goes on this like massive killing rampage and i'm not necessarily saying that's what jesus would have done but you know <laughs> come on like a lot of people wronged him isn't um, that how you celebrate we, easter <laughs> we don't know how accurately the bible well, was he, translated he, he, yeah exactly you know like he, he goes and gets the, he goes and gets the reaper Mm-hmm. Um, uh, which again is a really interesting uh, callback because at the point where Jeremiah says to Mandy when he's taken her over like look at me what do you see mm-hmm. what do you see when you look at me she says I see the reaper fast approaching yeah and the reaper is a massive fucking crossbow so she's basically saying like I'm not scared of you you're gonna get it <laughs> um, she knows what's gonna happen it's um, they go a bit further into the whole like religious iconography thing when he uh, wakes up and he is in this house again, like you said, Phil, with his hands nailed to the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first thing he does, uh, when he's offed the chatterer who is punching him or whatever, he just beats the shit out of them and throws them down into a pit, <laughs> is he picks up uh, a jacket which has a satanic rune on it. I didn't um, pick and that's, up on that. And that's what he wears. Like okay. his his jacket has a satanic rune on the back of it. 
That's interesting. Um, so it's a, this really interesting juxtaposition between weight. So all of the iconography up to this point has shown you as being Jesus and like <laughs> the Messiah. Yeah. And then you take that image and you place it upon yourself and that's how you represent yourself. I'd be really interested to know actually the top that says 44, like that. Ha- there has to be something in that. I refuse to believe that that's wow. just a... Yeah, there's a few things. Um, I read somewhere um, somebody made the comparison between like um, the son of Sam killer was with a 44 caliber killer. Mm. Um, uh, gosh, I can't Twain. remember. There was um, Mark Twain, yes. And there was a sports reference, but... Sports. What about Mark Twain? Uh, he, <laughs> sports. Wrote, sports. Sports. <laughs> he wrote a story called The Mysterious Stranger about a supernatural right. being who exposed the futility of mankind's existence who was referred to <laughs> as number 44. I mean, fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he calls the chatterer a vicious snowflake. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you, like oh, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I love him. He just, and from that point, like, he literally, he just goes full on badass. Um, mm. I've never seen somebody snort quite so much cocaine in one go. <laughs> you need to watch Sorry, Sorry to Bother You. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I've, um, I, I've recently acquired that, so I will. It's be, a good watch. Worry. It's great. Um, <laughs> I think it'll be super fun. Um, Go, just, just very quickly going back to the whole 44 and his jersey thing um, yeah. this this film was the second watch for me I hadn't noticed this the first time around um, obviously he makes that uh, comment of like oh this is my favourite shirt when it's torn yeah and it's you not until, my shirt yeah that's it um, it's not until right at the end where you sort of see the point at which he met Mandy in a flashback and that's the shirt that he's wearing. he's wearing that shirt, yeah. Oh, so sad. I know, it's so sad. Um, But, like, at that point, shit's definitely about to get weird. You know, he drinks the grey cum. I don't even know what it is. (laughs) I don't fucking want to know what it is, but he drinks some of it. Um, I find it really interesting that the deaths of the people who wronged him and who wronged Mandy Mm -hmm. have much less uh, sort of like pomp and circumstance. Oh, it's very much, I want you dead. I'm not going to drag this out. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the, but the film doesn't sort of make a big thing of like, oh, he's getting his retribution. Look at Mm. all the horrible ways in which he's killing these people. Like, yeah, they die in fucking horrible ways, but Mm -hmm. actually it's very much like a less than a minute, between seeing them and them being dead. Yeah, it's not like... I suppose it's different to a lot of revenge movies that follow a more, the more typical structure in like that... A like, more torturous yeah, they're more, like, kind of... deliberated, I suppose, the actual deaths in Yeah, in these none of it's movies. planned. He doesn't go away for a year yeah. and learn a martial art and then come back and take his revenge. It's very much, this thing happened, I want you all dead now. Yeah, and for some reason, he has like a blacksmith's forge in a cave near where he lives, because of course he does. Um, but yeah, the deaths are so quick and they're so like a boom, boom, boom. Like he, he kills one guy, he moves on to the next, he kills them, he moves on to the next, he kills them. It's like they're in his way, they're mm-hmm. not what he really wants. Um, apart from the only scene which is a bit elongated is where he's fighting with the one which is standing outside the burning car, who's saying like, she's still burning. Oh, was that the chainsaw willy waggling contest? No, that no, was... that wasn't. Right. It was the one afterwards. Yeah. Like right. he's 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 standing in front of a burnt out car that's in flames. If memory serves, oh. he's the one that gets the crossbow through like the head, and he gets a crossbow out. bolt in the neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it, is he the one that ends up decapitated? Mm-hmm. Yes, Nick Cage yeah. and Nick Cage lights lighting a cigarette, a cigarette off, his skull. <laughs> off a burning decapitated head is the biggest mood. <laughs> How fucking cool. <laughs> like if I if I never get to light a cigarette off a man's burning skull, then I'll be very disappointed in my life. I think the opportunity um, would be enough to make me take up smoking again. <laughs> <laughs> like if you found half a cigarette and you just decapitated a man who's on fire, yeah. you'd do it, wouldn't well, you? <laughs> <laughs> Give it a bash. Yeah. Um <laughs> That's the point. That's the point where he meets crazy, crazy LSD guy. Yeah, who's making LSD with no gloves on? Like, is that a thing? 
it's not the first thing that occurred to me about that scene. <laughs> like, I, he's got no a tiger, gloves. Rosie. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you don't see the tiger until you, like you see the LSD first. I know health and safety didn't occur to me at any point in this film. <laughs> Health and safety occurred to me quite a lot in this film. <laughs> and I think that says a lot about me as a person and how nervous I am. <laughs> I think my, he says, like, my overriding feeling was just, he's got a tiger! He's got a tiger. Which apparently was meant to be um, a lizard. Oh, until, yeah, I read that. Like, what? Yeah, it was, that's why it's called Lizzie. Because it's meant to be a lizard. And then the actor got on... Is that a Rampage <laughs> reference? I don't know. <laughs> but the actor got on, Did got you? on set and then, and then uh, Panos Constantos said, oh yeah, by the way, it's a tiger now. <laughs> my oh, head, sorry. Shit. In my head, that's exactly the sort of director I pictured him to be and I'm very happy yeah. to have that confirmed. <laughs> by the way, it's a tiger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you ever play Rampage? Didn't play it, seen the movie. <laughs> Very separate oh, things. No. Oh, is a rampage like, just the really basic one where like yes, you're a giant it's, basic. I used, I used going to up play a building? The, I used to play it on the Commodore 64. You you could choose between being a giant um lizard called Lizzie, um, a kind of King Kong character. Yeah, that's what I or, remember. Uh like a giant like werewolf or something. I can't remember what the third one was. Did, wasn't it just um, the the point of it was just Destroy destruction, buildings, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, utter destruction. Yeah, <laughs> okay. climb up the side of buildings, punch it until it falls down, and uh, av- like miss the shots from the helicopters. It was the Ralph part right. of Wreck It Ralph. <laughs> right, it, it definitely was. Uh, interestingly, Ralph was the name of one of the characters. Really? That's yeah, cool. it was Ralph, Lizzie, and um, something else. I, I just I can't remember the third one for the life of Tony. me. Tony, I played yeah Ralph, Lizzie, and fucking Neville. I played it to absolute death, um, and I and I loved it. So you saying that the tiger's called Lizzie? I'm like you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just takes me right back to then. Um, I mean, I guess that's the that's the point where he kind of finds the children of the new dawn isn't it because uh lsd guy says you exude a cosmic darkness mm-hmm. and i was like if anybody told me that i exuded a cosmic darkness i'd be like did we just become best friends <laughs> like, yeah i would take that as such a compliment <laughs> <laughs> you're damn fucking right i do um uh like i loved that scene i thought that scene was so uh weirdly ethereal mm-hmm. and like dark and just fucking weird and i was all about it um but then yeah he finds the midsummer church Um, quick question yes um i i don't know what to make of this i was i was gonna i had planned to ask you guys what you thought of the symbolism of the tiger because it crops up at a couple of points obviously he he wears a shirt with a tiger on it yeah um the post credit scene is her sketchbook and it's a drawing that she's done of Red backed by a tiger. Like his shadow yeah. is a tiger. Um, but it's interesting I mean, that you said it was supposed to be a lizard. <laughs> that kind of fucks with <laughs> what I, I mean, was... May- well, <laughs> maybe that's why they decided to make it a tiger. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious that like he is... He is the tiger. Well, yeah, but what's the symbolism? What is it about tigers that he's supposed to represent? I mean, they're fucking badass. <laughs> I mean, the only literary use that I can think of that jumps out of tiger. You're thinking Rudyard tiger, Kipling. Tiger, 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 you know, there are, I mean, tigers in themselves. And the tiger who came to tea, but there, I don't think that there was. Aren't, <laughs> there aren't many tigers, if any, in like heraldry, to be honest. And heraldry mm. tends to give a really good insight into like references around at the time. Yeah. Um, and it would have been seen as like an animal or a monster. Um, and you had like cheetahs and lions, but not tigers. Oh mm. my. Um, so 
Genuinely, I don't know. Maybe there's a cut of a film of the film that exists, and he's wearing a shirt with a lizard on it. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, there was the salamander. Wasn't with there? a lizard on. He, I think he wakes up. There was the salamander, salamander who, who who looks at him. Yeah. He just like looks at him and goes a boat <laughs> and blinks. <laughs> <laughs> that was super it was, cute was <laughs> and he gave him a very knowing look like it's all, it's all right kid i got you <laughs> i liked him um so go on you were yeah. talking about the the church oh the church were just like a hole in the ground and he goes yes this seems like a good idea mm-hmm. and <laughs> goes go spelunking go spelunking for cult members why not I mean, what else are you going to do? Um, and I think, like, we, you know, we've talked about the chainsaw fight and people dying, and the chainsaw fight was fucking hilarious. <laughs> I think, to be honest, that's something that surprised me about this film, especially on second watch. I'd forgotten the humorous elements. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I, I wasn't aware of them. Like, it's really unnerving when it seems like a ridiculous but quite straight-laced film mm-hmm. and then there are some bits which make you laugh out loud and yeah. then you're like, should I be laughing? Yeah. Is this I funny? Think that, that, I, sh- I assume they were intentional. That was the thing that I found. Like, I'd, I'd seen the trailer for this and I'd come in thinking mm-hmm. it was going to be mindless, I suppose. In the okay. sense, it's like Nick Cage. Just oh. But it, it was actually a lot more kind of um, introspective than I expected. It'd be a lot slower, particularly that start. Like, yeah. I found it to be like pretty fucking cerebral. Yeah. But, but in the sense of it, you know, having seen the trailer and focusing, which focused more on Nick Cage just killing everyone. Yeah. I expected it to be <laughs> a lot more. That was definitely like, the selling point yeah, in the marketing. I expected it to lot be a lot more kind of, for want of a better word, fun. Um, okay. So yeah. Think, it's, it's not. It's not a film I would describe as no, fun. Um, <laughs> no, not so much. So I think yeah, like that that kind of ties through to the humour as well. It was a mm. surprise seeing how much humour there was in it. You know? Yeah. So c- considering you assume the film was going to be fun, did you find like those moments of humour like a bit of welcome comic relief? <laughs> Kind of. I mean, I don't think it was quite as like depressing as other films have been. This isn't a film I wouldn't, I would like refuse to watch again. I don't think it's a depressing film. I think it's a film that makes you feel like you've been beaten up. Yeah. I think it's a depressing film. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, I, I, and I'm I agree the one with that's that. Dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with that. There, there are. It's punctuated by moments of like deep, deep sorrow, mm. and actually, it has this like overarching sort of feeling of loss and grief. Um, but just it's so high octane, mm. especially the second mm. part, and it's so the colours are so bright and jarring and. Um, yeah, for, for me, it was like it was like just being punched in the face repeatedly watching it. So, interestingly, um, one of my criticisms of this film the first time I watched it was that um, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of revenge movies mm. as a subgenre. Um, however, I'm kind of over films where a woman dies or gets raped and then a man and the guy takes gets revenge, his revenge on behalf of her like th- th- that's generally why i prefer rape revenge movies because yes these awful unthinkable ha- things happen to a woman but then she gets to take her own revenge she gets to take her her power back yeah um yeah so my issue with films like this is that it's not her power that's being taken yeah. back it's somebody else's and that more often than not the female characters are kind of fodder mm-hmm. Which is why I thought it was quite interesting in this case that she doesn't die until the midpoint of the film. Yeah. And I think it's more emotionally eviscerating because we do... I know you said she's kind of, at times, seems like a bit of a blank slate, but I think we get to know her far more than in films like, I don't know, Death Wish or Death Sentence where... Oh, when, like, they die straight away yeah. kind of thing, or they're raped straight away. Or yeah, like, they're just... All, yeah. the, all they are is to serve as a catalyst mm. for a man's revenge. And I think yeah. this was a bit more interesting. I mean, the film's named after her for a start She's yeah, kind of seen um, as the only pure thing in the film. She's the only thing that's uncorruptible. It's kind of a love note, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. A love note to her and actually the revenge that 
uh, Red takes, I don't think is revenge for Mandy. Mm. I think he knows that, like her bones floating away in the wind, like she's gone. Mm -hmm. I think the revenge that he takes is very much for him. I do. And I think another difference between a lot of films that I would liken it to is that I think the revenge is sort of seen as like something that's supposed to soothe them. Yeah. And in this, it's just unmitigated madness. Mm. He has yeah. lost it by the end of the film. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we, we're just at the point with what we were saying where he, um, finds Jeremiah. Mm hmm where he finds Jeremiah and Jeremiah is saying, don't come in here. This is a place of God. And he walks straight in, um, which is foreshadowing at its finest. <laughs> um, there's uh, what you were saying about the like red light signifying danger. I think at this point they definitely do because they're flashing on and off. Mm-hmm. And that's like a real sort of like warning. Yeah. Light. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure who that's meant to be for if that's yeah. a warning light for Jeremiah or a warning light for Red. I think, personally speaking, I think probably more for Jeremiah because I think Red's already passed way, way, way past the point of no return. Mm. <laughs> he's, past, he's past fucking caring at yeah. this point. And actually his dreams are getting more um, sort of um, apparent. They're getting more frequent mm-hmm. and he's beginning to see in his dreams this world that is created in the book The Eyes of the Serpent. Yeah. Um, And, like, more of that book, which is her favourite book that she kind of lives in, Mm -hmm. is beginning to sort of make itself more and more apparent. Um, So the the point at which he finds Jeremiah, like, I don't think he is wholly of this planet anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And his view is death and that's pretty much it mm-hmm. to skip ahead a bit when um, he's driving away after the um church has been set fire there are two God like damn. two planets in the air right in the sky yeah yeah no um i mean uh, yeah basically uh, the, that it, that's explained by the yeah. things that happened yeah, yeah, before yeah. it basically yeah. um so, but so just to touch on that very briefly like there was a conversation at the start of the film where they were talking about their favorite planets mm-hmm yeah um and just she, and she, she says, says jupiter jupiter but he doesn't he like f- he's more flippant and says like galactus or something which is <laughs> so he says he says saturn first right. of all and then he changes his mind and says because galactus. it's nick cage, right. and nick cage loves which is Marvel <laughs> and he comic loves books. his comic book movies <laughs> <laughs> there you go and i said he should have chosen unicron because unicron is a planet that eats other planets and so what is, is Galactus not then? Because that was my understanding of it. It was like the yeah, planet eater. I, uh, kind of... It's Fantastic Four, yeah. isn't it? That Galactus yeah, is in. in the film. It's the Silver um, Surfer because he's the head. Uh, the Unicron's of Transformers. Sorry, Unicron's Transformers. They're both like the 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 same thing. Basically, they're planets that eat other planets. Um, I'm a nerd. <laughs> So do you, <laughs> but do you think that kind of relates in a more literal sense to the um, religious... I don't even know what to call it at this point, because I... So if, if, if we make the assumption that he is um, representative of Jesus, but in if term- we make that assumption, yeah. then when he kills Jeremiah and he says, I'm your God now, mm-hmm. um, that's him killing what he has been told is his god yeah it's effectively jesus saying like fuck you i'm 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 the god now yeah that's what i mean eyes. sort of draw- like tom hanks kind of <laughs> but yeah to draw parallels between that sort of him kind of talking about galactus which is like the planet that eats other planets and him, so he's the god that eats other gods that kills other gods yeah yeah. Or yeah. No, I, I, I completely, I can, I, I can completely <laughs> see that as being like a very, okay. a very pointed sort of metaphor. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And um, when she says that her favorite planet's Jupiter, I mean, it's, it's the, you know, it's the planet of storms that last for thousands and thousands of years, and like there's a storm inside her clearly, but mm. it's also the largest of the planets, and it's seen as being the god of the planets, you know. 
Yeah, because so Jupiter, I think Jupiter this was in mythology. Jupiter was the equivalent of Zeus, right? Yeah. So I, I, I really feel like this film is the equivalent of a war of gods. Mm. That's um, a really interesting take. I like that. And and I I think it works really well as a take like that as well. Mm. Um, and I would be interested to see if actually any of the story was based in kind of like Greek mythology or something like that. Um, I don't know enough about it to say whether it is or not, but I'd mm. be interested if there were any bits that were taken from it. Um, but the point at which um, we're at now... Okay, so I wanted to ask you, the, the bit right at the end where Nick cage is driving and he looks across to the passenger seat mm -hmm. he sees uh the point at which he first met mandy and the lights uh the colors like strobing across her face mm -hmm. and then strobing in a different direction and then she's in the car with him yeah and you get that fucking face mm -hmm. <laughs> you get that, that fucking yeah. face like jesus christ <laughs> that face um what what significance do you think that had? What do you think that was? Which do you think that was just him losing his mind? Oh, absolutely. I think that was kind of wish fulfillment. I think perhaps there was a part of him that hoped in doing this, it would fix things. But obviously all he did was destroy more stuff and kill more people. And actually there is no undoing what was already done. So that That's was really interesting. That was him just that was his full descent into madness that's what i thought what, what, anyway what about you Pip? um yeah i mean I have, there's there's kind of a juxtaposition isn't there because it seems quite like you say peaceful and like he has found peace but then that's that hard cut to blood soaked nick cage and yeah you realize that actually he's not in that headspace that he hopes he'd be in he's clearly just mm. snapped and gone so i have a slightly different uh theory okay. do you think it's which still is the, the cocaine the, uh yeah for sure <laughs> um no the, so when he looks at her across the room like when there's a shot of his face and it's shrouded in red but it's like there's a halo behind it mm -hmm. in a very kind of like obvious like you are the god now yeah. kind of thing um but then it cuts across to her and she has this series of colors that strobe across her face and bearing in mind the color was so important throughout this film i was thinking about it and basically it strobes from like uh red to green to blue and then um she is in the car mm -hmm. so if if we assume that the red green. is like being bathed in Green is like the sort of summoning. evil, like traveling through evil. Yeah, but it's also like a summoning, summon things, a magical yeah. thing. Yeah, and then blue. Um, blue is a color which is used throughout the film, mm -hmm. um, surrounding Mandy specifically mm -hmm. as a color of like calm and presence. Um, and there's the shot where she's in the car and she looks over at him holding a cigarette and the entire screen is red, but she's shrouded in blue. Yeah. Um, when she is looking back at him with the crazy face, there's a frame of red around almost like a window. Mm -hmm. So I got the feeling that like with him now being a god, with him now being something more than human, he managed to like pull her back through from burning into his reality the fact that that was no longer our mm. reality is kind of beside the point but isn't like there a he point dragged her isn't there a point where it pans back and she's not there anymore she's not there anymore because he's lost his fucking mind yeah. absolutely okay but like in his reality he's brought her right. back okay um and then it pans out and you see the horizon and the reality that is in the book mm -hmm. the book is living um and that book is representative of her okay so they're kind of intertwined again and back together but in a completely separate reality which would fit <laughs> given everything we've seen up to that point because obviously there's so much 
that hints towards supernatural element, mm. spiritual element. Um, yeah. What's that I, the I, quote I, I about, really like it as a resolution. Yeah, th- there's a quote that was referenced when the, I was reading up about the film and it's something to do with like um, spirituality and psycho, um, the qu- psychosis. It's the quote that um, there's a f- they say in the final uh, scene. It's yeah. about mystics float while something drowns. That's it. Oh, but, like, no. Um, mystics swim. But the, no, mystics swim um while psych- psychotics drown while mystics swim and i'm mm. swimming the idea of being but there's the, a thin line between spirituality, spirituality and, psychosis. Yeah. and being yeah yeah i thought that was quite interesting no i completely agree and i think <sighs> and i think in his mind he is like a god and he is spiritual whereas we can see quite clearly that he's fucking crazy <laughs> at that point guys i'm pooped this was a thinker <laughs> this was a thinker and, and actually and actually given more time i think i'd have a lot more to say mm, yeah, sure. like, i really sure. got a lot out of this film particularly um, always what it's... we spoke about today like there's a bunch of things that i hadn't considered and i'd like to go back. does it make you want to go back and watch it a second yeah. time oh, for sure yeah. sure like i think there's so much that i've missed mm. okay there's um there's a just quickly there's a really interesting scene just um where they're looking up at the sky and it's all like space and stars and like this weird ethereal kind of like nighttime sky. Mm -hmm. And then the next scene goes very definitely from like air to earth to water and then to fire. And I didn't know sort of where that was going to fit in, but like this elemental sort of power and uh, it follows... Mandy coming out of the water and standing behind the fire, like I said, in that sort of sense of foreshadowing. Um, but it was like all four elements had built up into this one person. It was really super interesting. <laughs> um, but I completely agree with you. We have spoken at length about this, and I think that it is um, it's worth a rewatch and mm. maybe sort of like next year or something, maybe a revisit. Um, I think we'd find a lot more stuff to say about it as well. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I think you guys both picked up more than I did on my first watch. Um, <laughs> and ultimately after a second watch, I'm still not sure what's going on <laughs> at all. All of this was just guesswork and what, and based on what I'd read. <laughs> oh, it's, it's all complete conjecture course, yeah. realistically, but it's fun conjecture. Oh, yeah. which is, it's the kind of stuff I really I like yeah. conjecturing uh, about. Quick shout out to the use of the shepherd tone as well. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Um, I think no. Hans Zimmer used it in Dunkirk, but the idea is a bit of an audio, op, op, oh. audio illusion. It's a single rising tone. Oh, going up. The it goes up and up and up and up. It's all basically stacked in octaves, so you're all having the same note at once. Yeah. It just sounds perpetually rising, even though it goes nowhere. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect yeah. kind of analogy for the way the movie just relentlessly keeps on moving forward yeah. and moving forward and moving forward. Craziness. Yeah. Absolute craziness, mm. yeah. Okay, I've 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 learned a lot from you guys tonight, and I think Same. Um, we we've all sort of picked up on a lot more stuff than we thought we did. But I reckon that's time to wrap up. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to us. Find us on social media. Have a chat with us. We love talking to you guys. Um, but until next time, stay spooky. Bye. Bye-bye.